a, num a number of questions that we have not addressed is how actually we know that if given a, a, a network, um, we can ask lots of great questions, but how, where do we get that network itself? Um, so the network can be certainly built by human experts. Um, um, a lot of times, um, the human experts can actually provide the network topology. So the network structure, how, what are the nodes and how nodes are connected to each other um, and um, are given by experts. And we probably also have um, training examples um, involving those um, variables. So in those case, um, we can easily uh, learn this um, uh, uh, network by um, estimating the entries in this um, conditional um, probability distribution table for each, every variable is in the network. Um, this can be simply done by, remember what we did for naive Bayesian, we can just use maximum likelihood estimate on counting the occurrence and divided by um, total occurrence to find those um, uh, uh, probabilities to fill in those tables. Um, so this is scenario one, the, the simplest way. Scenario two, we have the network structure known, uh, we all, which means that we know all the nodes and how those nodes connect to each other. However, some variables are hidden. Um, this means the variables, um, we don't have observations data for, for those variables, or much of those data are missing. Um, some variables are observed, others are hidden. So in this case, one of the methods um, um, that's being used is to use gradient descent. Um, the book has a, a little bit more detailed explanation of this uh, method. Um, but what, what I can probably simplify this is to, to know that in order to learn all those weights, so the, in this task, our task is still to learn those um, probability distributions in those tables um, for each every variable. Uh, we call them collectively call them big W. In order to learn them, we can initialize those to be a random number to initialize all those node, uh, weights to be a probability to be um, um, a, a random set of numbers. And then we have a objective function that we want to um, maximize. Um, we want this objective function is basically to say, um, given, um, find the set of weights that would increase the chance for the system to observe the data that's given. So this can be, this problem can be formulated as a nonlinear, non-concave objective function, which um, I depicted here. I actually don't know what's the shape of the function, but it's nonlinear and it's, it's non-convex, so it, it's a concave. Um, uh, uh, function. What do I mean by concave? Concave, a concave function has the property that when you connect any line, any two dots on this curve, some of this line segments going to lie above the curve. Some other is going to lie below the curve. So this will give you a non-concave convex function. In contrast to this function is a convex function um, that any, draw any um, line segment between two, any two points on this curve, you're always going to get a line segment that's above the curve. So this is a convex. So now we have a, a non-convex function. The idea is to find um, either the maximum or the minimum that optimize our um, objective function. This is done by gradient descent or gradient ascent. They're the same thing, only the direction is different. So see, in this case, we want to um, find um, maximum. So in this curve, we have a number of, um, so showing here, we have this being a local maximum. This seems to be a global maximum. This is the highest in this curve. So we can actually, by tracing this, um, 
we compute the um, gradients, gradients pointing to the direction on this curve that make the curve increase the greatest or decrease the greatest, depending on the, the direction you're talking. So here we can, in order to reach to this point, we will just, uh, you know, every time adjust our weight um, towards this direction and getting a little bit better every time um, until we reached a point that our increase will not give our difference. Any, any gradients at this point are going to be close to zero. Um, so this is the idea of hill climb climbing. If you want to minimize, it's the same idea. You're starting from a random point, you'll find the, the, the direction that, that goes down and you follow this direction to find um, a minimal. Um, another point that I want to make here in this optimization uh, method is because this is a um, curve um, that's not convex, we actually don't know where the minimum or maximum points are. That's why it's called hill climbing, it's searching, where is my maximum? The system could um, get to this point and reach um, a plateau and, and believe, okay, this is my maximum, even though it's only a local maximum, this one is a global maximum. So any program that does um, hill climbing um, cannot be guaranteed to find the global uh, maximum or minimum. However, in contrast to a convex function, you can always find um, the, the global maximum because there's only one point that you could get um, a zero. Um, um, so when we actually move our points along the certain directions, um, how far should we move? That's the question of learning rate. So learning rate is um, depicted here. Um, the learning rate typically is very, very small. The reason is if we do small steps learning, so move our points um, in very small steps, we have a greater chance to find this um, minimum or maximum point. If we do large steps, we could jump over and missing entirely um, this um, uh, minimum or maximum points. So the idea the book presented when we want to learn a, a network structure um, that want to learn the, the, the um, probabilities in the CPT tables because we don't know. So we initialized with the random probability values and every time we adjust to that value and to make this um, probability fits the data a little bit better. So we do that iteratively until certain goals has been reached. Um, we converge to a local op optimum. Um, by that time, we should have weights in, in, the, in the graph um, that, that makes a um, complete um, network. We'll have um, not only the topology, but also the tables. Um, scenario three um, is the network structure is not known, but all the variables are given and are observed. Um, so we're going to talk about this later. Uh, surely, I'm going to just to give you some intuitions. Um, serial, um, scenario number four is you don't have the structure, you don't have the topology. Um, all variables are not. You have a set of variables, you don't know how they are connected, and you don't know um, um, a lot of those variables have missing values that you're not observing them. Um, so it's very challenging. Um, nobody have a very good solution for that. So scenario three, when we don't have, um, when we have the variables but not have a not network structure, we need to learn the network structure. Um, the idea, we have assumption here, when you solve any challenging questions, you always need to have some assumptions to simplify your, quest, your problem. So we assume all variables are independently and identically distributed. So their distribution are the same, all the variables are the same. Um, then we can compute mutual information between pairs of all the variables. Um, this mutual information formula is given here. Uh, you don't actually need to memorize that. Um, the idea is if these two variables are not uh, independent, then their mutual information under this distribution is going to be very low. If these two variables are somehow dependent, 
<coughs> excuse me, their, their mutual information given at, uh, under this distribution D will be higher. So with that information, we actually can um, just to connect to all the variables that we have, right, um, in this um, network, and we write our mutual information scores on the on the edges. And now we can actually from here build a maximum spanning tree. A maximum spanning tree is a tree that connects all the um, ed uh, nodes using the uh, edges with greatest score. So in this case, we have 32 here and 0.32 and 0.32. Those are the greatest um, uh, the, uh, values. Um, that connects all, all the nodes, okay? So if there's other, um, 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 once we have this set of nodes connected, then we can, because um, the network is directional, it's a directed um, acyclic graph, we need to find the directions. Um, this idea is also simple that we actually just pick random, make random selections, and then from this point, direct the arcs away um, from these nodes. So this is going to give you this uh, candidate tree, and this is going to give you, an, if we're picking A as the initial point, this is going to give you this candidate tree. Okay, so now we have lots of candidate trees that, that maximize, maximize the scores. Um, we need to decide which one is the best, right? Um, we we might actually have this all the nodes connected, but we could add additional uh, 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 arcs. Um, maybe it's showing that when you're adding more arcs, um, the data are going to be fit better than the than than those simpler graphs. However, remember every time when we do something complex complicated, we also worry about overfitting. Um, when we learn decision trees, we, we'd rather have a simpler tree with similar performance um, than having a really complex to big tree that has a little bit higher performance. So here the trade-off um, applies as well. We want the system, we want this uh, network to fit our data, but also we don't want it to be really fully connected. It doesn't give us any useful information. It is fully connected. So. Um, there is a um, the tree simplicity measure um, called dimension. Um, this dimension basically measures the formula is given here, but conceptually the dimension um, is the number of independent parameters in those conditional probability tables. Um, so there is easy ways to compute this. Um, this um, has um, this tree is more complex. It has dimension of fifteen. Simpler has nine and a dimension seven. Um, with those, um, so now we have two um, con uh, contradicting um, criteria. We want it, the tree to fit the data better, but also we want to reduce all those connections. This leads us to the final um, uh, objective function. Um, so this is how good the tree fits, the graph fits the data. And this is how complex the graph is. Um, so then the optimization um, uh, uh, steps could be taken to maximize the buff sc score to learn the best tree, trading off between these two um, factors. So this is the rough ideas, um, I mean, intuition um, in, uh, in learning on, on neural, uh, in learning a Bayesian belief network given different input. Um, you can learn all those things and the more, much more details in our um, Bayesian inferences class. Um, the last point I want to make um, with um, Bayesian belief network is to observe the similarity of naive Bayesian. Um, this um, is a graph that, that depicts the naive Bayesian uh, learning model that we have learned before. So basically, um, naive Bayesian graph is a special case of um, Bayesian belief um, network. What we see here is given C, given this class, 
all those variables are independent of each other. This is exactly our conditional independence um, assumption that we used in the naive Bayesian. Um, the only difference I want to point out, it's a very key um, difference is um, when we actually apply naive Bayesian um, my, um, algorithm, we did not require this C to be a causal factor for all those variables. So naive Bayesian has been applied out of context. You know, any C can sit here and connect it to X. Um, that's why we say the assumptions are often are not hold because we can use those variables to predict any class, even though this class, um, uh, the variable represented by the class doesn't really cause any of those um, variables. Um, but still, it's a simplification. It's a, it's a most just simple um, uh, base. The topology is, is very similar. Um, and the, the application of BBNs, um, obviously very broad in medicine, diagnosis, um, speech recognition, and many other things. Um, so I'm going to stop here and see if you have questions um, on the Bayesian Belief Network. Okay.